welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, tonight I have a simple little message out of the Word of God. I believe that God is going to build some things in our hearts, things that we maybe have known, maybe we've even been taught, but maybe we've never been taught about a godly perspective, about the way God sees it, the way God would have it to be. But listen, you didn't come to hear from me tonight. Didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young, the old, the black, the white, the brown, or any other color we could imagine. I'm not about hearing from a tall man, short man. Listen, let's get off of men and women, all right? Let's get on to God. So if you will, let's set our hearts on the Lord because the Holy Spirit is the teacher. So if you would, honor the Lord, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, tonight, what a joy and what an honor it is to be in your house, to be in your presence, God. We thank you for just times of refreshing, that we get to be in your presence, God, experiencing your goodness, your power, your kindness, Lord. God, tonight we honor you. God, we didn't come into this place to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old. God, we came to hear from the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit, our guide. And we thank you, Father God, that as we open up your word tonight, that you would open it up to us, open up our eyes to see, open up our ears to hear, open our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May we receive it with meekness, God, the implanted word which is able to save our souls. And may we produce fruit, not just fruit, God, but fruit that remains as you desire, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that as we put our interest and our attention in God and do our part, God, that you'll do your part and cause the word to come alive on the inside of us. Give us that now word, God. How wise you are that you can speak an individual word to every person in this room, God. That's just awesome. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches that are both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we bless all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, we ask that you bless them as you bless us this night. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. 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 You can get your Bibles out and go with me in your Bible somewhere. We'll get there eventually. That was a joke. Praise God. Some of you got scared. It's okay. Luke chapter 6, if you will. Luke chapter 6. You want to go somewhere? Go to Luke chapter number 6. Recently, uh, my wife and I were traveling, and as we were traveling, there was pressures on us. And how many of you know, oftentimes, it's the people that are closest to you that you just let your guard down, you feel the most comfortable just being mean to? Anybody else like that? I know uh, if any honest people in here, okay, a couple of you guys are honest out there. I know from, for myself personally, I find that oftentimes, uh, I don't know what it is, but, the, but my wife especially, we can, you know, our guard is down, we get into a situation, it's easy to just shoot off a comment, to be mean, to, to just say something, you know, and, and, and just because you know they love you and you know they're not going anywhere, it's almost like you have permission or license just to be rude, you know? And, and maybe you all are too holy for that or, or you're, you're beyond that now, um, but I'm still there and I'm still dealing with this. So we're, we're going through this time and, and, and we had talked to each other and we said, what is going on? We're at each other, we're, you know, we're, we know we're traveling, we know we're, uh, you know, got the kids and that sort of a thing and there's pressures on our life. And so we prayed and we just gave it to God. And it was almost as if God opened my eyes personally. I know my wife as well, as we were looking at the situation, looking at life. And as we were going throughout our day, going to breakfast, going, doing different things. And as we traveled, it, it was like just an, a realm opened up to us. God started showing us different people, different things that were taking place. I noticed when people would open up a door for me and would hold it and wait for my kids to come through. I I would notice when somebody would go the extra mile at the cash register and make sure that we knew what it was that we were doing, make sure that we were taken care of. I I noticed when, when somebody was smiling and when somebody was really genuine. And it almost caught on that I realized, man, I need to to have this same sort of a thing. As Christians, we ought to be the most wonderful, most kind, most loving people in the world. And I know that sounds so cliche, and and, and we've been taught, you know, and especially if you watch the news, you watch television, you watch any of that kind of stuff, we've been told that, you know, Christians are hypocrites and that if we're nice, we're kind, we're loving, then we've got to be a super hypocrite, you know, because really the world is that bad and things are that terrible that we we should have a frown on our face or something like that 
But as Christians, we have a hope. We have a hope in Christ. We have a hope of eternal life. We've got a hope that, you know what, this is not how it's always going to be, that this can change. Why? Because I'm a praying Christian, and my God is a big God, and God will take care of me. God will do supernatural things. God will overwhelm and overcome the situation that I am in. And even though it may look bad, I don't have to look bad, and therefore, I'm going to smile. I'm going to go out of my way for somebody. I'm going to sow love, sow goodness, sow kindness into the world around me. And so my wife and I, as we were traveling, we, we started to, to see ourselves reciprocating. You know what I mean by reciprocating? We started to see ourselves doing, started to see ourselves not just reacting, but now being proactive and, and going after things. Uh, we parked at one place in the city that we were in, and as we parked there, I, I paid for two hours, and we, we went and we had breakfast. We came back, and we only had used an hour. And as we were about ready to pull out, I noticed there was another car pulling in behind us. And I said, you know what, I've got a whole extra hour on my parking ticket here that I could bless them with. And so I ran back to the other car, and, and I went up to the window, and there was a man and his wife there in the car. And I said, excuse me, uh, you know, roll down the window. I gave him the international sign for roll down your window. And, and even though nobody does this anymore, they just do this now. So, but I, I still was going like this, you know, roll it down. And, and so they did that, and the window came down. And so I said, hey, you know what, I've got a whole extra hour on my ticket. Do you guys want this? And the lady looked shocked. I mean, it was like you would have thought I just slapped her in the face or something like that. She was just, you know, like this. And the guy must have been a surfer, dude, because he was like, dude, you so totally rule. <laughs> I haven't been told I rule in a long time. It, it, was, it really did something for me personally. I was excited that I ruled now. And so I just, I, I was so blessed. Even though it was a small amount of change for a parking meter, I didn't care. It blessed me. Tonight, I want to talk to you about a subject called reconnecting with kindness. Reconnecting with kindness. See, it's an unkind world we live in. You go out there on the job, you got people that are sourpusses, unkind people on the job. Your boss might be, you know, the taskmaster. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, maybe because of that, you realize that you've become the taskmaster or the task slave, and you've become unkind, responding to the world around you. I mean, it, all it takes is getting on the 10 freeway at any time of day to start learning about unkindness, right? I was driving here tonight, and I said, oh, Lord, I'm preaching on kindness tonight. I, I got to be nice to these people, you know, as we're driving on, and people are cutting me off and cutting in and slowing down when they should be speeding up. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and you know, everything in this world is designed to cut you down, to, to, to stop you, to halt you in your walk with God and, and in the things of God. And yet God says, I want you to be like me. Follow my example. Follow my way. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. What does that mean? That means that we link up with the way he's doing things. And I, and I had you turn with me to Luke, chapter number 6, verse number 35. Take a look with me. Luke, chapter 6, verse number 35. Jesus is speaking, and he says, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. See, all of us that are born of the Spirit of God are now considered sons, whether you're male or female, you are a son. See, girls, you got to get used to being a son because we men have to get used to being the bride of Christ. Okay, so it, it evens out. Don't worry. But Jesus said that if we love our enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, our reward will be great, and we will be sons of the Most High. Look at what it says. For He, capital H, speaking of God, He is what? He is kind to the unthankful. Now, that would be enough. We, we would say, yeah, I can be kind to the unthankful, but look at the next one, and evil. Some translations actually say He is kind to the unthankful and the wicked. Hmm. See, we could look at this world and we could say, how could God prosper the ungodly? How could God allow those people to do that? How could God bless these people? They're unkind, they're unthankful, they're evil, they're contrary to the ways of God. That's what evil is. They're wicked in their ways. And yet God still loves them. God still allows them to prosper. God still allows them to have live the life that they're living. And yet the Bible doesn't ever tell us that we should be mad about that. Why? Because God is kind to everybody. He's kind to the unthankful. He's kind to the evil. Remember, Jesus Christ died for us, 
the thankful and, and now the godly, the saints of God, those who have been born again, he died for us while we were saints? No, while we were yet sinners. Before we knew to be thankful, before we were walking in the ways of God, Christ died for us. Christ died for us knowing what we would do. See, in this day and age, we're looking backwards on the cross. We're looking back to the redemptive work of Jesus. That means that Jesus Christ, in his death, knew that we were going to mess up and sin and still died for us anyways, knowing what we were going to do. See, that should blow all of us away. And if God can be that kind to us, then we can love our enemies. We can do good. We can lend, hoping for nothing in return. Because why? We're going to be sons of the Most High, and our reward will be great. Are you listening today? Mark Twain said, kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. See, when, when you're kind, you start showing people who Jesus Christ is. Why? Because you're his son. You know, people look at my son. I've, I've got a son. He's my middle son. People look at him, and they say, man, that is just a stamp. That's a little Pastor Dan running around. Really, if you look at pictures of me when I was that age, man, it, it really is close. But here's the deal. People look at my son, and who do they see? They see the father. In the same way, if you start going out there and doing the works that God does, and you display the kindness of God, people aren't just going to see you. No, they're going to see your God. Are you listening? They're going to see past you and see Jesus who died on the cross. And Jesus said, I come to show them the image of the Father. He is the express image of the Father. So now they're not only going to see Jesus, they're going to see a loving Father. That's what this is all about. That's why we have to reconnect with kindness. Why do I say reconnect? Because we were taught this. We were taught this in the worldly sense, right? From a very young age, we were taught to share. We were taught to do good, not to say mean things. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. See, we know this, and yet we've gotten away from it. Why? Because we think that we're mature. We think that we're adults. We think that the situation that we're in warrants unkindness or meanness or rudeness or whatever it is. And yet God is saying, I want you to reconnect, but not just reconnect in the way that you were taught growing up. That's basic. Let's reconnect with what the Word has to say. And when we start getting into the Word and we start understanding, how does God want me to respond here? How does God want me to do this? What does God think about this? Now, all of a sudden, we can start to be the people of God that God wants us to be, men and women. You know, I kind of picked on the men and women a second ago. Let, let's go individually. Let's start with the men. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 22. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 22. If you want to turn there, you can. It's a great verse. Proverbs chapter number 19. Verse number 22, Proverbs 19, 22 says this. It says, what is desired in a man is what? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I only heard about a third of you guys. What is desired in a man is what? Kindness. Kindness. That is what makes a person desirable. See, we so want to be approved of. We so want to be accepted. We so want to be needed sometimes that we do everything else except being kind. And in fact, in the Hebrew, that word kindness is really loyal, covenant love. Going beyond the expectation, swearing to your own hurt, staying with it, staying after it, being loving, even in the face of adversity. And it says, and a poor man is better than a liar. Now, for years I read that and I thought, what does that mean? Anybody read that and just say, I, I don't get it. You know, I, it's okay. I, I, I didn't get it. I was thinking about this, but think about this. What is desired in a man is kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. So if the desire is kindness, and now we're talking about a poor man, well, what's the opposite? Rich, right? So that means even greater is a desire for kindness than a desire for riches. Why? Because would you rather have a poor person who is kind and loyal and loving, or would you rather have a rich person who's a liar, a cheat, a thief, backstabber? We all would say, well, give me the poor man, right? Why? Because who cares about money? Who cares about wealth? Who cares about riches of this world? I want somebody who loves me. I want somebody who's kind. I want somebody who, when the chips are down, they're going to have my back. 
They're going to be there. They're not going to backstab. They're going to cover me. They're going to they're be with me. They're going to pray for me, right? See, that's what's desirable in a man. I love what Alexander McLaren said. He said, kindness makes a person attractive. If you would win the world, melt it. Do not hammer it. See, oftentimes we go out there and we try and, and win people to the Lord. And how do we try and win people to the Lord? Well, most of the time it's debating. It, 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 it's browbeating with the Bible. You know, hey, you need to, right? And, and you got to do this, way. Right? But God says, just be kind. Start loving people. That love and that kindness will open the door in ways that you never imagined. I've heard of a guy that, that was going to uh, Dwight L. Moody's church. And he walked across Chicago in the snow to get to his church. On his way to D.L. Moody's church, he had to pass up several other churches. And they said, why do you walk all this way to get to this church when there's tons of churches on your way? And he said, because they love a guy over here. See, that's why I know a lot of people drive to the rock. is because we love a guy over here. Why? Because this is a kind place. This is a place that welcomes people. This is a place that doesn't judge, doesn't criticize, doesn't condemn. We don't care about how many tattoos you have. Don't care about how much you've messed up. Don't care about how many exes you have. See, this is a place that's kind. This is a place that's loving. This is a place that will melt the stony hard heart. How about for the ladies? Proverbs chapter 31, the virtuous woman. Are you listening, ladies? Proverbs chapter 31, verse 26. Thank you for that feminine Amen. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 26, look at this. She, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Same word, loyal covenant, love. On her tongue is that law. On her tongue, she's speaking those things. She's telling her children about it. She's talking to her husband about it. She's telling her friends about it, not gossiping. No, she's out there talking kindness. Talking love, talking loyalty, covering, loving, blessing with her tongue. See, that will do so much. An unkind woman, ladies, you know, when somebody's unkind and when they've got a tongue that hurts, mm -mm, I'm going to stay away from them. They're, they're a gossip. They're a busybody. I'm going to stay away from them. But when they're kind, oh my goodness, call them on the phone, get them over to your house. Let's make a play date and let the kids go do their thing. And we're going to talk. Why? Because kindness See, it's a desirable quality in a man or in a woman. Can you say amen? amen? So tonight, a couple of things, how to connect with kindness. A couple of things from the Word of God, how to connect with kindness. We learn what it is, you know, we learn that God is kind, we need to be kind, we learn that it's a desirable quality. How do we connect with it? Well, number one, how to connect with kindness. Number one for tonight, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. Some of you knew I was going there, didn't you? Galatians chapter 5. Talking about the fruit of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Galatians chapter number five, there in the New Testament. In Galatians chapter number five, it talks about the works of the flesh, what happens when we walk in the flesh. It talks about the things that take place, all of those. It just is a list, a dirty laundry list, if you will, of all the things that take place when we walk in the flesh. But then it switches over and it starts to talk about the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 says this. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. Now, I want you to notice that a part of the fruit of the Spirit is kindness. In, in, the, in the old King James Version, in the old King James Version, if you will, it says gentleness. Some of you guys have that, you know, you memorize it, OKJV, gentleness or kindness. But I want to point out something to you. If we're talking about kindness, talking about how to reconnect with kindness, in an unkind world, in a world that, you know, it's natural to be mean, it's natural to drive on the freeway and get road rage. We all do that. It's okay. But how do we reconnect with kindness? Well, we've got to get into the Spirit of God. We've got to walk in the Spirit and not walk according to the flesh. See, we could go left-sided and we could say, my goodness, this is the way that it is. This is how I feel. I thought it, therefore I let it out of my mouth, right? Or we could choose to go right side and we could say, you know what, I'm going to walk according to the Spirit. I'm going to go according to the will and the way of God, not do things my way. I'm going to do things God's way. And I'm going to get into the Spirit of God and now I'm going to allow the Spirit to produce fruit in my life. 
which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And allow kindness to be a natural byproduct of walking in the Spirit. See, if you're connected and linked up with the Spirit of God rather than with your flesh, the natural tendency in the Spirit is going to be kindness. The natural tendency in the flesh is to be unkind. So how do you determine which is which? Well, you know what's unkind, right? We know the words that hurt. We know the actions that are abrasive. Uh, kind of funny, my wife and I, when we were having that first part of our, our trip, when we were being unkind to each other, I remember we were having an argument, and it was over, I don't even remember what now. Well, my wife looked at me and said, you had a tone. Any men ever had a tone? Okay, a couple of brave men out there. The rest of you, your wives are sitting next to you. It's okay. Just sit still. <laughs> she said, you had a tone. See, it wasn't what I said. It was how I said it. How much trouble, how many fights could we avoid if we were kind? See, I, I, I think when we argue as husband and wife, I know me personally, my wife and I, when we argue, a lot of times we're arguing more about the non-essentials of the argument than we are in dealing with the actual matter. Why? Because someone wasn't in the spirit, and even though they may be right, they were unkind. <laughs> I'm not saying who's which, because I have to go to bed tonight. But isn't it the truth? Don't we all do that? Don't we get mad at the boss? Why? The boss was unkind, so we respond unkind. Oh, you didn't like that? Well, here's my report on it. Well, why is your report missing? Well, you didn't need that, right? We start arguing. See, you will get passed up for a promotion if you're unkind. Hello? Oh, we want the promotion on the job. We want to be in management, but we can't be kind? Oh, come on. With your children. I know it's hard sometimes to be kind to your children. Why? Because they're stupid. <laughs> yeah? Messing around, doing the wrong things. And, and if they do the wrong thing enough, and sometimes it isn't what they're doing, it's just the way that they're doing it. Dad, daddy, dad, <laughs> dad, what? You know? The women, I, don't, I wish I could do what they do, but I can't do it, right? The, the kids, mom, 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 mommy, mama, mom, 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 mommy. And somehow to the woman, it's like static. Shh. I finally have to say, would you listen to your children? You're driving me crazy. <laughs> but we got to learn to be kind. Why? Because those little hearts can get hurt very easily. See, kindness will go further. Kindness will take you farther. And as you walk in the Spirit, God will produce that in your life. And the way to determine is you know when you're in the flesh. Remember the King James Version says gentleness. See, gentleness is, is handling something in a way that's not going to break it. We know that the people around us have frailties, right? There's insecurities. There's issues in people's lives. And, and kindness is being gentle with that person's frailties. You understand? So if you know that there's a red button that they say, don't push this button, here's gentleness. Don't push the button. Are you listening? If you know that somebody's weak in an area, kindness supports that weakness and encourages and edifies where they're strong and helps them to get strong in that area of weakness. Kindness overlooks an offense. Kindness goes the extra mile. Kindness forgives. Why? Because we know that there's a frailty in that area, that they could be hurt, that they could be damaged in that area. So I'm going to be gentle with that. I'm going to handle that very carefully, and I'm going to be kind. It'll take you further than you ever dreamt. How do we reconnect with kindness? Well, walk in the Spirit, number one. Number two, how about this one? Walk in love. Walk in love. Very familiar passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Turn there with me. You're in there in Galatians Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 has been deemed the love chapter. 
verse number four, it starts to describe the characteristics of love. Very interesting that the characteristics of love are very close to the characteristics of walking in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 4. Take a look at it with me. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, does not pray to itself, is not puffed up, continues on, to, does not behave rudely, right? It's the opposite of that. It's kind. Very interesting also to note that 1 John, the fourth chapter, says that God is love, right? So we could say God suffers long. And God is kind. So if we're going to imitate God, then we could put our name in there. I could say, Dan suffers long. And Dan is kind. Dan does not envy. Dan does not parade himself. Dan is not puffed up. Dan is not rude. So you can put your name into the scripture. Why? Because this is about you. This is about me. This isn't just a a nice little fuzzy learning lesson that we feel good about ourselves and, oh, I learned something new or a history lesson that we say, oh, that's interesting. No, God is not interested in that. God is interested in when we walk out of these doors, we get in our car and we start to drive out of this place and we hit a line to get out of the gates. We're not even to the freeway yet and somebody's already wanting to cut in. Now, all of a sudden, God is interested in your life. God is looking at how we respond. When you wake up tomorrow and the kids are going crazy, when you wake up tomorrow and the bills need to be paid, when you wake up tomorrow and you go to work and the boss is unkind or your coworkers are gossiping or backbiting or whatever it is, God's looking at your life to say, how are you going to respond? Are you going to respond in the flesh? Are you going to respond in the spirit? Are you going to respond unloving or are you going to respond in love? Because love suffers long and is kind. That means that in the face of repeated offenses and adversity, it still remains kind because it is suffering long. Wow. Wow. William Barclay said, more people have been brought into the church by the kindness of real Christian love than by all the theological arguments in all the world. See, oftentimes we, we hear that somebody's of a different religion. We hear that somebody is agnostic. Maybe we hear that they call themselves an atheist and we immediately want to break out the ammo that's in our gun that you can't be an atheist because you don't believe there is a God. You can't be in every place at one time to know that God's not sitting behind the moon. So you can't be an atheist, right? And we've got our arguments and we've got things all lined up and we're ready to just, right? And yet, you know that when those things come out, people go, hmm, if that's how being a Christian is, I don't want to be like that. And yet, when somebody calls themselves an atheist, and you start to express the kindness of God, and you overlook an offense, and when they're unkind, you're still kind to them, they start to look around. Why? Because they thought you were going to respond a certain way. They sent out unkindness, expecting unkindness back. They send out unkindness, and they get kindness back. All of a sudden, they say, wait a second. What's different about you than everybody else in this place? I want what you've got. Now you've got an open door to tell them, hey, there is a God. He is loving. And what you see in me is a reflection of him because I'm walking in the spirit. I'm walking in love and my God is love. That's his nature. That's who he is. That's what he does. And now his nature's on the inside of me and that's who I am and that's what I does. Are you listening tonight? Mother Teresa said it beautifully. She said, we're all pencils in the hand of a writing God who is sending love letters to the world. What's the love letter that God is writing to your family? What's the love letter that God's writing to your neighbors? What's the love letter that God is writing to your coworkers, to your relatives? What's the love letter God's writing to the person at the gas station that you just happened to come across? What's the love letter God's writing to the person that set up next to you at the beach when you're taking a break on a Saturday? What's the love letter God is writing to the clerk behind the desk? It's had a rough day. See, your kindness is that letter. My goodness, the Apostle Paul says that we are all living letters, living epistles, that God has written on our hearts, and now we can be read and known by all men. 
And as we walk in love, people read our lives. And when there is genuine Christian love expressed in kindness, it will melt the world. It will just soften the hearts, and it will turn people to Jesus. Are you listening tonight? Last thing, reconnecting with kindness. Number one is walking in spirit. Number two is walking in love. Number three, and this is the, where the rubber meets the road. This is really what it all comes down to. Choose to be kind. How do you reconnect with kindness? Walk in the spirit, walk in love, but it is a choice. You are always going to be presented with the choice. Am I going to walk in the flesh or am I going to walk in the spirit? Am I going to walk in love or am I going to be unkind and just do my thing right now? See, it's, it's a choice and we have to choose to be kind. That's why the Bible uses certain terminology. Let's take a look at it. You're there in 1 Corinthians. Turn to the book of Colossians. Colossians. We're going to take a look at two passages, very similar passages, one in Colossians and one in Ephesians. We'll, we'll start with Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. I've got verse 12 up on the overheads. I'm going to read verse number 13 because we're going to pull a thought out of that, and then we'll come back to that thought in the book of Ephesians. Okay, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12. Take a look at this with me. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12 says this. It says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. Everybody say, put on. See, that's a choice. You can either put it on or you can leave it off. Am I right? When you got up today, you took a shower, hopefully, brushed your teeth, please. You decided to do what? Put on some clothes. And you chose what clothes you put on. Is that right? Nobody walked out and handed you to put this on. Unless, you know, your wife is just that cool and does that for you. Like sometimes my wife does. But you chose and you said, I'm going to put this on. I'm going to, even if somebody handed it to you, you still had to make the choice to put it on. Nobody forced you. Nobody strapped you down and made you put on your clothes. You had a choice. You said, I'm going to put this on. So now here the Bible is saying as Christians, as the elect, as the holy, as the beloved, put on what? Put on tender mercies. What's the next thing? Oh, come on. Some of you guys are tracking. What's the next thing? Kindness. Kindness. Put it on. You have a choice as a part of your Christian wardrobe to put this on. Put on tender mercies. Put on kindness. Put on humility. Put on meekness. Put on long suffering. There's that word again. We keep coming back to that. Have you noticed that kindness and long suffering go together? just like love does. My goodness. And then it says, bearing with one another, verse 13, and forgiving one another. Now, I want you to, to store that in your memory banks, forgiving one another, because we talked about kindness and forgiving. I want you to just log that, that it talked about you have a choice to put on tender mercies, kindness, and to forgive people. Turn me to the book of Ephesians. A couple books back to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse number 31, and we'll read through verse number 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away. See, before we were putting on something, right? But this says, put this stuff away. Put it off. Take it off. These are the fleshly things. These are the earthly things. These are the natural response to the circumstances, responding unkind, responding in the flesh, rather than responding in the spirit. So it says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32, and be kind to one another, tender Hearted. Remember tender mercies? Now he's saying tender hearted. And look at the next word forgiving. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. In other words, God was kind enough in your sinful state to love you enough to bear with you, to long suffer, and to forgive. And now because God forgave all of your junk, all of your sin, all of your stain, washed it clean by his blood, now you have not just a, a, a choice, you have an obligation that if you are a Christian, this is how you ought to act. I know we've been told that choice is choice, and if you choose, then you're cool. If you don't choose, you're not cool, 
right? You, you just whatever. You can do your thing. Truth for you is truth for you. Truth for me is truth for me. Our, our age, our society has said whatever you want to do, that's okay as long as you do it and, and you stay true to yourself. Listen, if you are true to the word of God, which is truth, then it's not just a choice. This is an obligation. Jesus said, forgive and you will be forgiven. But he said, if you don't forgive, neither will your sins be forgiven. So as Christians, yes, we have the choice and we need to choose wisely. We need to do the right thing, but we need to understand that this choice is vitally important to our lives. That kindness shouldn't be something that we say, that was a really warm, fuzzy message that Pastor Dan gave Wednesday night. I really appreciate the fact that he used nice words, and we walk out of this place, and then we live like the devil for the rest of our week. That's not the choice that you're being presented here. This is the eternal word of God. This is the truth from God's word. This is the oracle of God. God is saying it. We need to respect it and fear God enough to say, God, you were kind to me. You loved me. You forgave me. God, I'm going to go the distance for those people that hate me, that have hated on me, that have backstabbed me. God, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to release it. God, I'm going to let it go. God, I'm going to love them. God, I'm going to just melt them with kindness. And then leave the results to God. You're not responsible for other people's lives and actions. You're responsible for your life and action. God says, be kind. Why? Because you've been given kindness. Freely you've received. Freely give. Things that God has poured into your life. You shouldn't be a cistern. You know what that is? That's a big well that just holds water. No, you're supposed to be a channel. You're supposed to be a funnel. Everything that God has poured into your life, you should be pouring into the people around you. You say, but if I pour out, then I'm not going to have enough. Oh, no, no, no. This well never runs dry. This stream never stops flowing. When, when you allow God to move through you, you will find that you have more than enough, the Bible says, for every good work, because God is able. God will make grace to abound towards you. And this grace of kindness, this spiritual fruit that can be produced in your life by, number one, walking the Spirit, Number two, walking in love. And number three, by choosing every day to say, I'm going to be kind. I'm going to love people. I'm going to go out of my way. I'm going to smile. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to let somebody in line in front of me at the store. I'm going to bless somebody. I'm going to pay for the dude behind me at the drive-in. I- I- I'm going to go the extra mile. I'm going to go the distance. See, that is uncommon in this world today. And that's something that the world around us will stand up and will take notice of. Tonight, what did we learn? We learned about kindness, reconnecting with kindness. How do we connect with kindness? Number one, walk in the spirit. Number two, walk in love. Number three, choose to be kind. Can we give the Lord a praise tonight? (laughs) Hallelujah. I want to make sure you guys are right with God before you leave this place. It would be a tragedy if we came into the house of God and had such a good time singing and praising the Lord like we did. It would be a tragedy if we received the word of God and we laughed and we understood and we really got something. I really do believe that you guys got something from the word of God. Thank you for allowing me to speak that into your life tonight. But it'd be a tragedy if we did all that and then we let you walk out of this place and your heart wasn't right with God. You died and you went to hell. You didn't go to heaven. Come on, tonight, let's make sure that that's not any of you in this place. Sometimes people are so offended by that word hell, they think that you're being unkind even because you just said the word hell. Well, listen, it's a very real place. And just because I'm in your face about it doesn't mean that I'm being unkind. I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. Hell is a very real place spoken about in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Jesus talked about it. And so it's a very real place that you're not going to get out of just by denying its existence or sticking your head in the sand and hoping that it passed you by. See, hell was never intended for you and me. Hell was intended for the devil and his angels. And God doesn't delight in people going to hell. He's not mean. He's not cruel. No, God is kind. But we choose with our lives where we're going to go, whether heaven or hell. God gives us that free will choice. See, he could have made robots to love him. He could have made millions of angels, billions of angels that could bow down and worship him. And yet God said, I want people to have the choice to love me. And so he gives us that choice here on the earth. And with that life that we live while we're here on the earth, we choose whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. Now, sometimes people say, well, all roads lead to heaven. You know, God is so kind and loving that God just lets everybody in. That's why Jesus went to the cross. And you know what? uh, You know, you get there your way, I'll get there my way. And and we'll all get there somehow as long as we stay true to ourselves. 
Did you know that nowhere in the Bible say all roads lead to heaven? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible will say you do your thing, I do my thing, or we all do some well-meaning church committee's thing, and that gets us into heaven. It doesn't work like that. You've got to get there one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. So what's that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, one who wrote the plan of redemption, one who carried it out in his son, Jesus Christ, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross, don't you think that if he did all that, that he would tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does in his word. Sometimes people hear that and they say, well, yeah, I know God's way to heaven. It's just by being good. If you're good enough, you'll get to go to heaven. Maybe if you do more good than bad or, you know what, you're nice to your neighbor. You, you clean up your act. You used to be bad. Now you're good. You know, haven't knocked over a 7-Eleven in a while. And you've really, really been a nice person. Give money to charities. And, you know, you, you've gone out of your way for people. I've been kind like you're talking about, Pastor. I've shared with people and gave money and helped out and that sort of thing. Isn't God going to let me into heaven because I've been good? The answer to that question is no. Because nowhere, check it out, nowhere in the Bible say you can be good enough to get to heaven. It's not there. You can't be good enough to heaven, in fact, because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And the Bible says that our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. That means it's going to get thrown out. It's not going to get to stay. So come on, tonight, let's talk about where you're at with God. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I was raised in church. You know, I, I've always considered myself to be a Christian. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. But in America, America is a Christian nation. Maybe they took you to religious classes, Sunday school, catechism class, Sabbath school class, hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child. Therefore, you think that you're going to get to go to heaven. You know that nowhere in the Bible just say your parents raised you in church, tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nor in the Bible does it say that you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, or because you think of yourself as a Christian, that that makes you a Christian. Nowhere. Check it out. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're born in America or that you're not some other religion that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Come on. Tonight, let's talk. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, you know what? I'm going to go to heaven, not only because when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church in front of you right now. And I consider myself to be a Christian. Right now, I'm sitting in church. I'm a Christian. But the problem with that thing is, you know that nowhere in the Bible says sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It doesn't work like that. That's like saying that you could go down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, wear the uniform, sit in the dugout, bring your bat and your ball, call yourself a Dodger, and think that you're going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find you sitting there, drag you out, and lock you up. Why? Because you're not a Dodger. Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, but wait a second, wait a second. Not only have I attended church, my last church I got involved in, I sang in the choir for a number of years. I helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even taught in the Bible classes and got a membership card to that church. And while that's great, and I'm glad you've done those things, could you just show that to me in the Bible? Can you show me where you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions? People think of you as a leader. Or that because you teach in the Bible classes that you get to go to heaven. It's not there. Check it out. And again, nowhere, nowhere does it say in the Bible, God is looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. You might be thinking, but I know God. I mean, I, I know who he is. I, I could quote scriptures to you. I celebrate Christmas and sing the songs. Celebrate Easter every year of my life. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian because I know God? But the, if you'd read your Bible, you know the demons know who Jesus is. They believe that he's the son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. If you'd read your Bible, you would know that the devil himself can quote scriptures. And he knows who Jesus is, believes that he's the son of God. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head, knowing who God is or celebrating a holiday, having some mental ascent towards God, being able to quote some scriptures. But rather, this is about your heart. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Because if not, then I love you enough to tell you the truth tonight. You're not going to make it. Because Jesus said you must be born again. Now, I know Hollywood and our societies made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the coals, made it out to be something that it's not. But this is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. In the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot 
or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, lukewarm is a little in, little out, little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything, and you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say look out? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. It's all or nothing with Jesus, all of your heart and all of your life. Tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence and all. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. You're going to point at me and count? I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh. You might be. Let's get over that tonight. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. And yet Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight it's your call, your choice. You can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God, or you can push past that embarrassment. Tell the devil to go jump in a fiery lake, and you can get your hand up. Get right with God. Going on with God. Headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Giving him all of your heart. Giving him all of your life. Now, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of two, God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about your salvation, come on tonight. You can make sure. Who should raise your hand? If you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving him all of your heart and all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can raise your hand and get right with God in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family room, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or in the Love Rock Cafe, come on. You're ready to get your hand up. God is watching. Then you can tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards or wherever you're at online, you can raise your hand. God is watching you right where you're at. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. God bless you. Who else? There's four. There's five. There's six. Gotcha. Seven. Gotcha over there. Anybody else real quick? There's seven wise people already. Seven, eight, nine. Got you guys over there. Nine. Got you up there. Ten in the family room. Got you. Eleven. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? You know you need to give God all of your heart. Thank you, number 12. Thank you, number 13. Gotcha. Anybody else real quick? 13 wise people already. If you know you need to do this, come on. Don't wait any longer. Let's get right with God. Headed for heaven. Denying your presence in hell. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? Come on. Come on. Come on. If that's you, don't wait. Come on. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Yeah, you should. Who else tonight? Anybody else? Is that a hand up there? Gotcha, thank you. Who else? Over here? Gotcha, thank you up there. Gotcha. About 14 wise people. Who else tonight? Were you at number 15? Number 15, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Come on, go for it. God just spoke to you. That's you. Who else tonight? Number 15, come on, where you at? Just pop it up when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, I'm going to close this up. This is your last call, last chance, and then I'm going to close this up. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. Come on, don't miss out on this opportunity. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for about 14 wise people tonight. (laughs) Hallelujah. God is so good. All 14 of you, or if you're number 15, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a shout. As we do, I want you to get a hold of whatever you brought with you to church, your Bible, purse, friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that until we get you down here. Now, listen, no one leave during this time. Very rude. We're being kind. We're encouraging them to come forward tonight. So we're all going to stand. Let's all stand and welcome them. If you raise your hand, you should raise your hand. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on down. Come on down right now. You come. And anyone who calls upon his name. Come on. They They're coming. Let's give them a hand. Saved. They will be saved. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. And anyone who calls upon his Come on, come on, come on. From the they family rooms, you can bring your children. Saved. Come on down. They will be saved. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. 
his name they will be saved. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. They come on, come on, come on. You can come too. And anyone who calls upon his name. All right. We still have a couple more coming. There's room for you guys. We'll wait for you. Anybody else if you need to come? Just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Come on down. All right. Praise the Lord. They're still coming. My goodness. My goodness. God is so good. Hey, everybody up front, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, okay? You came to give God all of your heart. You came to give God all of your life, all right? Now, listen, right over here to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you? This is Dr. Becker, okay? If you can't remember Dr. Becker, Dr. B. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Listen, you've already got past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter tonight. He's cool. And, and listen, the only weird thing about him is that he's got an accent. He's from South Africa, all right? And so you're going to hear that, but it's wonderful. You're going to want to listen to him more, okay? And so he's going to do three things with you. He's going to, number one, lead you in a prayer, simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free stuff, some free literature that our pastors wrote to help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Easy reading. Listen, you need to sit down and find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? Third thing he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer? Helps you out at the gym, helps you get strong. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. It's easy, it's free, he'll describe how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out in the church service. Now listen, listen, I want to make a promise to you guys, okay? Give us one year of your life here at this church. Sitting under the teaching here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center, one year. At the end of that year and for the rest of your life, here's the promise. You are going to be so blessed. You're going to say, I didn't know it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? One year. It all starts with an SPT, okay? So, Dr. Becker, if you guys will make a left turn, follow Dr. Becker right this way. Love you, Dr. B. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.